Thank you all for joining us for our six Howard Mathematica panel discussion. I'm proud to introduce some of our six Howard Mathematica alums who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Nanette. My name is Roshan Miles, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Mississippi in the Department of Social Work. And I research compassion fatigue among nurses and social workers who work with clients who have an infectious disease. And I'm also a six Howard Mathematica 2021 alum. My name is Regina Ebo. I'm a third year psychology PhD student at UC Berkeley and a six Howard Mathematica 2021 alum. And I'm honored to introduce our panelist, Ifama Ajunwa, JD PhD. Dr. Ifama Ajunwa is an award-winning tenured law professor at the University of North Carolina School of Law. She's also the founding director of the Artificial Intelligence Decision-Making Research Program at UNC Law and a faculty associate at the Berkham Klein Center at Harvard University since 2017. She is also a visiting fellow at Yale Law School 2022 to 2023. She was a 2019 recipient of the NSF Career Award and a 2018 recipient of the Derek A. Bell Award for the Association of American Law Schools. Dr. Junwa's research interests are at the intersection of law and technology, with a particular focus on the ethical governance of workplace technologies. Dr. Junwa is a founding board member of the Labor Tech Research Network, which is an international group of scholars committed to the research of the ethics of AI used in the workplace and for labor. Dr. Junwa's writing has also been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and the Harvard Business Review, among others. She's on Twitter at Aya Junwa. Welcome, Dr. Junwa. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, today, I'll be speaking about AI in employment and its liabilities. Um, uh, just for reference, I am the founding director of the AI Decision Making Research Program at uh, UNC School of Law, and my, my focus there is research on automated decision making um, in all spheres, but specifically in the workplace. Um, so first, I, I want to start by describing what I see as a paradox. So I believe there's a paradox wherein automated decision making is often adopted as an effort to eliminate human bias. However, there's actually evidence that automated decision making serves not just to replicate, but to amplify bias. And what I mean by that is that there are really four major problems, specifically with AI in hiring. The first is that um, the design features of automated hiring platforms may enable them to serve as culling systems that discreetly eliminate applicants from the hiring pool uh, who are actually part of protected categories, meaning you know, they belong to categories of racial minorities or um, minorities like women without retaining a record. The second problem is that automated hiring systems can also allow for the deployment of proxies for said protected categories like gender or race. Um, and then with the use of those proxies, the results can then be presented as fair, albeit that they are discriminatory. And then thirdly, we also see that intellectual property law, specifically trade secret law, can actually be used to protect automated hiring systems from outside scrutiny and allows discrimination to go undetected. Finally, a worker's lack of control over the portability of applicant data captured by automated hiring systems actually increases the chance of repeated employment discrimination thus raising the specter of an algorithmically permanently excluded class of job applicants, meaning that certain applicants might find themselves algorithmically blackballed. So what is this evidence of bias that has been found? Well, for one, um, there was uh, the headline making issue of Amazon uh, scrapping a secret AI art recruiting tool that it had actually specifically created for the purpose of diversifying its workplace. The problem was that this secret AI recruiting tool had actually showed bias against women. Um, when investigated further, uh, the finding was that most likely the AI recruiting tool had actually been trained using training data in which women were underrepresented meaning that 
potentially that training data was really just the resumes of top performers at Amazon. And unfortunately, with the historical imbalance um, in gender um, among uh, software developers and coders, uh, that meant that actually most of those resumes would have been uh, belonging to men. And therefore, the AI tool picked up the wrong lessons, which is that um, women were to be deprivileged and that men were preferred. Another headline making issue was uh, when Facebook was found to have been letting um, advertisers on its platform target only men. Um, so this was actually about 15 employers who had basically been using Facebook algorithms to target their job advertisements to people who were presumed to be male on the park platform. And those ads were found to be basically playing to gender stereotypes. Uh, furthermore, uh, Facebook was also sued uh, because of allegations that um, it had also been allowing advertisers to target um, users of Facebook based on age. Um, so this was an age discrimination lawsuit alleging that Facebook had allowed uh, advertisers to use its algorithms to basically um, de-privilege um, or eliminate um, people who were over 40 from seeing its their ads. So why the focus on the workplace? Well, I believe that there's actually um, an algorithmic capture of the workplace happening. And this is especially um, relevant when you look at automated hiring platforms. Um, so for example, you will note that Walmart hires about 2.3 million people per year uh, for its workforce. And Walmart also solely hires via automated hiring system. This is the same for Kroger, IBM, Home Depot, McDonald's, Essentially, all the major retail uh, corporations, uh, really all the top uh, 20 Fortune 500 companies are using automated hiring platforms. Uh, that means that automated hiring platforms are really the gatekeeper uh, for job opportunity in America. So why is this a problem? It's a big problem because uh, when you look at the nature of hiring algorithms, really the reason they were created and uh, their expected function, it's not really to diversify the workplace. Even though there's now sort of a, um, a reputation attached to them as being maybe neutral or unbiased, the true reason they were created was really to um, quote unquote clone your best worker. Right. So that was a tagline um, in the research that um, my co-author Danielle Green and I did. We looked at archival sources, over 135 archival sources, and we found that the marketing, the raison d'etre really of automated hiring platforms was to clone your best worker. And that's really the idea that you're essentially recreating the workforce you already have uh, based on people you think are best workers. Um, what you can see there is the potential for discrimination because if you have a workplace that historically has excluded minorities, especially racial minorities, then what this algorithm is going to do is basically replicate that same uh, historical racial discrimination. Um, and then you might ask the question though, like, if a corporation has found that certain types of workers are great and work well for that corporation, then what's wrong with that? This is really the idea of cultural fit. Shouldn't corporations be able to exercise discretion? Shouldn't imply employers have discretion as to who they hire? And why does that matter? Uh, well, it does matter for equal opportunity, right? Because as previously explained, you know, we have a history, right, of workplace discrimination in the US. So if you have a workplace that has historically excluded uh, some groups of people, then using cultural fit as a hiring criteria or uh, criterion is going to further replicate that uh, exclusion. 
Um, it's and it's going to codify it, right? Because the thing with cultural fit is that it's really a nebulous concept. People are really constantly rethinking what they mean by cultural fit. So interviewers, for example, uh, might be able to think they can gauge cultural fit, but a lot of times that's actually something that's not easily ascertainable until the worker starts working. With cultural fit used as part of automated hiring, however, you're basically codifying it and concretizing it as part of the algorithm. And there's no really discretion to understand that it's a malleable concept, it's a nebulous concept. So you're really, in some ways, codifying discrimination, codifying bias. So I'll start with something I call the story of Jarrett's. Uh, and it's really the idea that automated decision-making can, in some ways, also help to um, discover or um, highlight bias. So um, this speaks to the relevance and importance of auditing. So the story of Jairus is really a story of auditing of an automated hiring system, right? Um, when the system was audited, that was part of hiring um, uh, as a, at a corporation, the corporation used its training data, which is really its top performers, and asked the question of like, what would be the two main factors, right, that this um, hiring system would show is uh, prevalent, right, in who is a good worker, right, that is highly correlated for who is a good worker, right? Those two factors were that the applicant was named Jared, right, one, and also that the applicant had played high school lacrosse. Now, you might say, well, those are innocuous factors. They're not, you know, it's not explicitly stating race. It's not explicitly stating uh, gender. But the, the truth is those are proxy variables. So let's break it down. When you go to the Social Security Administration website and you look uh, for the prevalence of the name Jared, you find that people named Jared are predominantly white and male. Uh, similarly, when you investigate the use of high school lacrosse, you might think, okay, high school lacrosse, this is a team sport. What they're really saying is that they want somebody who is a team player. And isn't that a fair thing for an, an employer to uh, desire and to choose for? Well, there are several other team sports, right? So the question is, why high school lacrosse? Why not basketball, right? That's another team sport. Why not football? Also another team sport. Well, high school lacrosse is a team sport that is played at mostly affluent high schools because it is an expensive game. The equipment is expensive. Affluent high schools, the ones that would offer high school lacrosse, are located in affluent neighborhoods. Because of the history, right, of racial segregation in the United States, affluent neighborhoods are usually predominantly white. So then this leads you to understand that um, high school lacrosse as a variable is actually also a proxy for race. Um, but what this highlights once again is this important of auditing automated hiring systems because although they may not explicitly be choosing for uh, you know, uh, prohibited uh, variables like race or gender, they may still be using variables that are actually proxy variables for those prohibited variables. So I'll talk next about what I see as the closed loop system of discrimination. Currently, there is no federal law requiring the auditing of automated hiring systems. New York City does have a law um, that it recently instituted for auditing of automated hiring platforms, but generally there are no laws in most states and there is no federal law uh, requiring this auditing. What this does then is that it creates a closed loop system of discrimination. What that means is first, you have algorithmically driven resume sorting, which then has the potential for discrimination through selection criteria, which are proxy variables. 
Then you have automated onboarding, which actually can have potential for inadvertent discrimination through one size fits all approach. Then you have automated evaluation, where you now also have the potential for discrimination um, through evaluation criteria that can also be proxy variables. Then you have the algorithmic driven advertisement, which is actually being derived from the evaluation. And then that advertisement then feeds into the resume sorting. And thus, without any auditing, you can actually have bias at all stages of this closed loop system. So with that, I really want to highlight the importance of auditing. Um, I also want to um, note that this issue, I discuss it in further detail in my forthcoming book, The Quantified Worker, um, where I talk about the ways in which uh, the use of AI in the workplace is quantifying the worker in a manner to a and to a degree than we had not previously seen in history because really the technology now allows for this minute quantification. So there really is a need for um, people who understand uh, the technical uh, capabilities of the system and also the potential to drive bias and discrimination. So there is a need to develop auditing regimes um, as I have described. And my next project really is, uh, I will be interested in working with um, social uh, scientists and um, data scientists and CS people to actually create an automated hiring system that would have built-in design that would allow for auditing um, and that would um, be able to do this, right, really on a loop on its own and would then provide that results for um, review. And so that project, um, I hope to start in uh, the uh, fall 2023. And the idea is really to build this as a, a prototype that could be certified by the EEOC and that could then be rolled out for adoption by all major corporations and thus having uh, you know, fairness by design built into the system, having um, accountability uh, in terms of uh, any machine learning procedures, and then also having this auditing system that's also built in by design and that can be called upon at any time. So with that, I want to thank you for your kind attention. Um, you know, I in my book, I really go into what business leaders should do. And um, that's also part of this article. And um, please feel free to contact me. Um, I am at iajunwa at gmail.com or on Twitter at iajunwa. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for your kind attention. Um, please feel free to reach out to me and I maybe I can get to work with some of you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I know our participants are looking forward to live Q&A with you during your Institute panel this summer. Thank you all for watching. For more information on SIX Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.